all nations, Canada has the longest coastline in the world. To the west, the Pacific. To the east, the Atlantic. And to the north, the Arctic. In all, some 243, 791,000 kilometers of coastline. Canada provides surveillance and control over a vast region, ensuring the integrity of its borders, the well-being of its resources, and the safe passage of all who travel its territorial waters. As well, Canada provides support to international bodies to secure waters beyond its shores towards the promotion of world peace. This ambitious task is the responsibility of the Canadian Navy. The history of the Canadian Navy is inextricably linked to that of the British Royal Navy. It was here in Chibacto Bay, Nova Scotia, in the year 1749, that Britain established a garrison that would become its largest naval base in North America. The following year it was named Halifax, and it has always been the key to maritime security in the Northwest Atlantic. Throughout the 17th to 19th centuries, the nature of Canada was determined by sea power. From the French fur trade to the Pax Britannica. In the 19th century, Britannia ruled the waves with its huge, undefeated imperial fleet. Canada had its own large mercantile and fishing fleet. But Canada, like the other colonies, relied on Britain and her Royal Navy for protection. At the end of the 19th century, Britain still had the largest naval fleet in the world. But British naval supremacy was being challenged by Russia, Germany, France, the United States and Japan with their expansionist tendencies. And the pace of technological change was accelerating. Global defense was becoming an increasingly expensive proposition. Since the late 1880s, the British Admiralty had maintained that the only useful role her self-governing colonies could play in naval defense was to contribute money to sustain the Royal Navy's new fleet of large, steam-powered, big-gun steel battleships and cruisers. Australia had made such annual contributions, but Canada refused, seeing it as a challenge to Canadian sovereignty. The issue became a hot one after 1900, as Britain made stronger demands. In the face of the German threat, the Royal Navy withdrew its naval units from Canada's coasts for service in European waters. Many Canadians were convinced they had to do something for the mother country, but many others believed Canada was completely safe from troubles elsewhere in the world and should do nothing. Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier's solution was to organize a modest Canadian Navy, mainly for the defense of the coasts, but big enough to give some help to Britain. Like many political compromises, it was attacked from all sides in the House of Commons and the media. Finally, on May 4, 1910, the Naval Service Act received royal assent. The act approved the organization of a Canadian Naval Service and also authorized the establishment of a Naval College and Reserve Forces. Canada could now build its own Navy. The first step in that process was the purchase of two cruisers from the Royal Navy in late 1910. The smaller of the cruisers, the elderly HMCS Rainbow, was the first ship commissioned into the RCN. Sailing from Portsmouth via the Straits of Magellan, she reached Esquimalt Harbor on Canada's west coast in November to join the RN station sloop HMS Shearwater, which was dressed in her honor. Esquimalt Harbor was first surveyed in the 1840s, and the gold rush of the 1850s and 60s brought numerous vessels from around the world. In 1865, the British Admiralty recognized Esquimalt as a permanent naval base for the Royal Navy, and the area developed rapidly thereafter. On November 9, 1910, the day after Rainbow arrived, Esquimalt Dockyard was transferred to Canada. Manned by Royal Navy personnel, Rainbow acted as a recruiting center. HMCS Niobe 
the larger of Canada's first two cruisers, arrived in Halifax in the fall of 1910. Commissioned in the Royal Navy in 1897, she was a powerful cruiser at 11,000 tons, mounting 16 six-inch guns, plus smaller guns and torpedoes, with a speed of 17.5 knots. Like Rainbow, she was manned by RN personnel. RN officers and men in Niobe and Rainbow had the option of becoming part of the new RCN, and many did. One of those men was Walter Hose, commander of the Rainbow. In his own time, he was called the father of the RCN. A widely experienced RN officer, and later, the first chief of the Canadian Naval Staff, Hose made the enormous naval expansion of the Second World War possible. Although Canada had a navy of its own now, it was in practice still very much a subset of the Royal Navy. Most of the equipment, the culture and the regulations derived directly from the Royal Navy. Decade after decade, RCN officers trained and saw service with the Royal Navy as part of their introduction to a naval career. In the peaceful years before World War I, Canada expanded rapidly through rails and roads. The country was seven million people strong, and a quarter of them had arrived since the turn of the century from overseas. But in 1914, those distant lands drew all Canadians into the Great War. Empires came unstuck as the world was thrown into the bloodiest struggle it had ever seen. A newly united Germany now challenged Britain as an industrial, colonial, and naval power. In Sarajevo, an assassin's bullet plunged Europe into war. When Britain declared war on August 4, 1914, Canada and the rest of the empire were automatically at war as well. Canada's chief thrust was to send soldiers, ultimately over half a million, to help the mother country. Troop ships left Halifax and crossed the Atlantic with Royal Navy escorts. German cruisers were now on the loose in North American waters and menaced the huge cross-Atlantic shipping trade that sustained the British economy and war effort. Therefore, Britain had no choice but to send cruiser forces back to Canadian waters. With only 350 officers and men and some 250 slightly trained reserve members, the tiny RCN put its two cruisers and personnel at the disposal of the Royal Navy. Their task was to join the British warships in patrol, escort, communication squadrons and blockade, cutting off the sailing of German cargoes from ports in the neutral United States. The Canadian Navy and other Canadian government departments also supplied full operating facilities to the British squadrons. The very day war was declared, the enterprising British Columbia government purchased two submarines from a Seattle shipyard. Two days later, CC-1 and CC-2, originally destined for Chile, became the RCN's first subs and carried out coast defense patrols from Esquimalt. Submarines were a new, relatively untried naval weapon. Britain had 75 and expected to use the subs defensively. Germany had 30 U-boats and planned to use them offensively against the British fleet. No one had foreseen the submarine's crucial role as a strategic weapon against merchant shipping. No one imagined that ships would be torpedoed on sight, a tactic that violated the rules of war as established by the Hague Conventions. Even a realist like Winston Churchill did not imagine that such a campaign would ever be undertaken by a civilized nation. The world was therefore shocked when, in 1915, the luxury liner Lusitania was hit by a single U-boat torpedo off the south coast of Ireland. She went down with the loss of over 1,000 lives, including over 150 Canadians and 128 Americans. By the end of 1916, U-boats had sunk 1,360 ships. As Germany's economic situation became more desperate, the concept of unrestricted warfare was emerging. 
the Niobe was turned into a depot and training vessel to support a new RCN anti-submarine patrol force, which ultimately included 150 converted yachts, trawlers, and other small anti-sub vessels. In the winter of 1917, the collision of an ammunition ship in Halifax Harbor resulted in a blast that leveled much of the city. 1,600 people died the first day, and 9,000 were injured. This was the world's largest man-made explosion until Hiroshima. Nothing was spared, not even the dockyard or the Royal Navy College, which had to be abandoned. The explosion was the direct result of Halifax's major role as a shipping port for war supplies and ammunition to the Allies. The explosion badly damaged Niobe's superstructure, and seven crew members were killed outright. But she was able to carry on as a training vessel. This is Admiralty House in CFB Halifax. Over the years, it served as the official residence for the Commander-in-Chief of the British North American Station, as an officer's mess, and during the Great War, as a hospital. Severely damaged by the Halifax explosion, it was closed for the remainder of the war. Today, it serves as home for the Maritime Command Museum and to a remarkable collection of Canadian naval history. In 1917, the U-boat war nearly finished off Britain. This was a turning point in the history of sea warfare. Since isolated merchant ships were most at risk, the only real solution was the convoy, an ancient naval device that had been used during the formation of Canada itself. In attacking the convoy, U-boats risked drawing the fire of well-armed escorts. Although the Royal Canadian Navy did not play a large operational role in World War I, Canada's small ship anti-submarine force and the logistical organization of the Navy made it possible to quickly organize a convoy system in the Northwest Atlantic. Some 2,000 merchant ships sailed in convoy to Great Britain from Halifax, Sydney, and Quebec City in 1917 and 1918. Canadian shipyards constructed many of the convoy escorts, including 100 drifters, 36 trawlers, and 18 H-class submarines. At war's end in 1918, nearly 10,000 served in the Canadian Navy. There were over 150 ships in commission, and a naval air service had been formed for convoy support. A national merchant fleet was emerging, and modern shipbuilding had begun. Canada had the makings of a navy, but it would barely survive the peace. In June 1919, at the Palace of Versailles, the map of Europe was redrawn. The defeated Germans had little to do but sign documents that had been written in secret by the Allies. The Peace Treaty of Versailles was designed to ruin Germany and make her pay for the war. So severe were the terms of peace, it can be said that Versailles sowed the seeds of the Second World War. Canada joined the newly formed League of Nations, a well-meaning but ultimately ineffectual attempt at territorial integrity and world peace. Back at home, the Canadian government once again debated the very existence of the Navy. For the vast majority of Canadians, the Great War was a fading memory. And so, too, was the RCN. In the absence of an impending war, budgets were slashed. The fleet was reduced to three ships on loan from the RN. The cruiser Aurora and destroyers Patriot and Patrician. Total personnel was reduced to 500 people, and the Royal Naval Air Service did not survive the post-war cuts. All hopes lay in the League of Nations. Commodore Hose commanded the East Coast Anti-Submarine Patrol Force in 1917-1918, and experienced firsthand the need for a reserve of at least partially trained personnel. Faced with severe cutbacks, Hose proposed an innovative idea to raise a naval volunteer reserve in the cities and towns throughout Canada and introduce young men to the idea of naval service. During the 20s and 30s, the RCN's main function was to foster, encourage and train the new Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve. Remarkably, there were waiting lists to join. Without the volunteer reserve, the phenomenal expansion of the Second World War would not have been possible. 
the Champlain, and Vancouver were lent to the RCN by the Royal Navy in 1928 to replace the aging Patriot and Patrician. The first major ships to have names associated with Canada, they were used on both coasts for reserve training. In the early 1930s, war was once again looming on the horizon, and neither Britain nor the United States could provide the full protection Canada needed. Somehow, money was found to commission two new ships, HMCS Saguenay and Skeena. These British A-class destroyers were modified to meet Canadian requirements. Steam heat, ice strengthening, added storage and refrigeration. Modern, comfortable and built in Britain, they were dubbed the Rolls-Royce destroyers. In the late 30s, these ships were joined by a group of C-class destroyers purchased from the RN and given the names of Canadian rivers. Fraser, Saint-Laurent, Restigouche, and Ottawa. They came to be known as the river-class destroyers. During the Great War, mariners relied on inaccurate hydrophones and the naked eye to detect the submerged enemy. The simple depth charge started development in 1915, but did not achieve its first kill until two years later. But in the interwar period, the technology of naval warfare advanced, much of it in response to the submarine threat. ASDIC was a highly secret device developed near the end of World War I. The original name was probably derived from the phrase Allied Submarine Detection Investigation Committee, but it was later changed to SONAR the U.S. acronym for Sound Navigation and Ranging. Using sonar, a narrow beam of high-frequency sound was transmitted underwater in a chosen direction. The reverberations from the sound tailed off in the familiar sonar ping, which was the random returning echo from all the bubbles, fish, and tiny sea life. If the sound hit a solid object, like a sub, it came back as a metallic echo. Sound travels through water at a known speed, so the range and bearing of the sub could be accurately determined. Using the Doppler effect, the pitch shift of the returning echo, you could determine if the sub was steering toward or away from you. Sonar's maximum range was about 2,000 yards. The British sorely overestimated the capability of sonar failing to take into account the distorting effects of salinity and thermal layers. Sonar was virtually useless when surface attacks took place. As the technology of warfare evolved, the political world of the 1930s was rapidly changing. With the rise of dictators Adolf Hitler in Germany and Benito Mussolini in Italy, in 1936, when Hitler repudiated the Treaty of Versailles and signed the Axis Pact with Mussolini, the Germans marched into the Rhineland, annexed Austria, and moved on to the borders of Czechoslovakia. Global war was rapidly approaching. Germany's surface fleet was growing into a formidable force, with three new pocket battleships and two super battleships. In naval thought, the submarine threat had paled, and the Royal Navy, together with the Royal Canadian Navy, anticipated a blazing big ship war. The Germans did not openly expand their U-boat force until the last year of the peace. And neither the British nor the Canadians were prepared to fight the U-boats when war was declared in 1939. The day after the United Kingdom declared war, the passenger liner Athenia, bound from Liverpool to Montreal, was sunk without warning by a U-boat near the British Isles. It was all too reminiscent of the Lusitania. From its very beginnings to its very end, a fierce and relentless war unfolded on the sea for five and a half years, the Battle of the Atlantic, a war of industrial might, technological know-how and material, it was critical for the Allies to move supplies from Canada and the United States to Great Britain in preparation for the reinvasion of Europe. Canada's foreign trade was in large part carried by British ships. 
worldwide control of Allied merchant shipping was taken over by the Royal Navy. Thanks to secret Canadian-British naval preparations during the last months of peace, this time, convoy could be implemented immediately. Convoys assembled in such anchorages as Halifax's Bedford Basin for the Atlantic crossing. Until the U.S. entered the war in December 1941, Halifax was the principal convoy point in the Western Hemisphere. Considering the enemy's resources, the RCN had little to work with at the outset of war. Just six destroyers, four minesweepers, some 1,500 regulars, and about the same in the reserves. The rush to build a substantial fleet in 1939 was far too late, and the Royal Navy provided almost everything, from training and equipment to regulations and standards. The RCN faced a desperate, difficult situation, but they rose to the challenge. Small vessels were rounded up and armed for trade protection and control. Three Canadian national steamships were taken over and converted to armed merchant cruisers. In the early years of the war, Allied shipping losses to the U-boat menace were heavy. Drawing on their World War I experience, the Germans perfected Rudel tactic, the deadly wolf pack technique. With the fall of France in 1940, the U-boats were moved to bombproof pens on the French coast, closer to their Atlantic prey. A wolf pack of many U-boats would concentrate on a single convoy. Positioning themselves ahead of the convoy in daylight, they would race ahead on the surface to attack at night. High surface speed and low profile would get them past the escorts and foil underwater detection. U-boats would destroy Britain's trade, the Germans boasted, by slaughtering the independent ships first, then decimating the convoys. From the beginning of the war until the spring of 1941, convoys were only afforded local escorts out of Halifax, and then steamed their way across the Atlantic with no anti-submarine protection until meeting the Western Approaches escort west of Ireland. In 1940 alone, U-boats sank 400 ships, over 2 million tons. Only 22 U-boats had been killed, and many more than that had been built. To fill the chronic need for escorts, the U.S. supplied Britain with 50 World War I destroyers. Canada manned six of the old four stackers. New destroyers were needed immediately, but Canadian shipyards could not yet build them. So it was decided to build minesweepers and anti-submarine corvettes. 18 Bangor minesweepers and 64 corvettes were ordered from Canadian yards in early 1940. The Corvette was based on a British whaling boat design from the late 1930s. The proposed name, patrol vessel or whaler type was not to Winston Churchill's liking and he dubbed it Corvette instead. This vessel, HMCS Sackville, was commissioned in 1941 and saw action in the Battle of the Atlantic as a convoy escort. Today is the last surviving Corvette. Sackville has been totally restored as a museum in Halifax Harbour. Corvettes were small ships, only 200 feet long, extremely uncomfortable, with primitive equipment, an early form of ASDIC, depth charges, a single four-inch gun, and a light anti-aircraft weapon. Corvettes had to bear the brunt of the convoy work, while the destroyers were packed defensively around the British Isles, holding the English Channel in the face of an expected invasion. The wolf packs were moving farther west, and in May of 1941, the Admiralty asked the RCN to cover the Central and Western Atlantic with a new escort force. Based out of St. John's, the Newfoundland Escort Force was under Canadian command and consisted mainly of RCN ships. Destroyers and corvettes were sent back to Canada from the Western approaches and supplemented by a rush of newly constructed corvettes from Canadian yards. 
corvettes were intended to stay at sea for only a few days, but they spent months in the North Atlantic, refueling in Iceland, where the weather varied between bad and terrible. They had a tough job to do, and the crews could do little but hang on. Personnel were so desperately needed that they were often sent to sea with a mere three months of training, the so-called 90-day wonders. Working with inadequate detection equipment, the Canadian convoy escorts faced a daunting task in fighting highly trained and heavily armed wolf packs. In 1942, with the U.S. in the war, the U-boats mounted a devastating assault on the eastern seaboard from the Grand Banks to the Caribbean. Canadian escort operations expanded south to New York, and the Newfoundland Escort Force became the Mid-Ocean Escort Force. Losses were horrendous. Over six million tons of Allied shipping was lost in 1942. U-boats had penetrated the Gulf of St. Lawrence and ranged within 172 miles of Quebec City. Sonar conditions in the Gulf and inshore waters were very poor. 20 ships were sunk and three damaged, including the Newfoundland ferry Caribou, which sank with the loss of over 130 lives, including many women and children. A St. Lawrence escort force based at Gaspé escorted convoys with a small force of corvettes, sweepers, and armed yachts. But in September of 1942, the St. Lawrence was closed to shipping. In the same year, the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service started. Young women across Canada, 18 to 35, were encouraged to join the Wrens, and there were plenty of volunteers. Some 6,500 Wrens served during the war in a wide variety of shoreside administrative and operational tasks. Officer training was started again after a 20-year hiatus. HMCS Royal Roads in Esquimalt became the Royal Canadian Naval College, and the first entry of 100 cadets arrived in September 1942. Professional training involved seamanship, navigation, marine engineering, torpedoes, signals, and gunnery. Drill played an important part in the training, as did a variety of sports, and the cadets went to sea for about one month a year. Overall, training reflected the Royal Navy approach, but now Canada was training and graduating its own military professionals. By the end of 1942, the RCN had commissioned close to 200 ships. With 32,000 people and new tribal class destroyers, the RCN entered the year 1943 a big navy. Merchant sinkings were at a peak, but now the tide of battle began to change to the Allies' favor. In the closing years of the war, the U-boats suffered disastrous losses, with casualty rates of 75%. Many came to think that going to sea in a U-boat was equivalent to committing suicide. The U-boats were defeated by a combination of factors. Improved intelligence, more convoy escorts under the direction of skilled staffs, and new technical advances in radar and detection equipment. New corvettes and frigates turned the tide, armed with powerful anti-sub weapons such as the Hedgehog, which fired a pattern of explosive bombs ahead so the ship could strike while still holding sonar contact with the sub. As Allied anti-sub skills rose, German submarine capabilities declined a development compounded by the desperate recruitment of personnel from non-naval sources. Aircraft carriers and long-range aircraft filled the gap in air cover in the middle of the Atlantic, the Black Pit, where the U-boats previously ranged at will. The advantage had been taken from the U-boats, and they never regained it. But the war was by no means over. Throughout 1943 and 44, the U-boats came back at the convoys with their own new technology. Deadly acoustic torpedoes homed on the sound of a ship's propellers. But within weeks, the Allies subverted the weapon with decoy devices towed astern. 
Canadian scientists and researchers played a leading role in developing this technology. Late in the war, the Nazis developed the snorkel, which allowed them to run on their diesels with only a small air breathing tube above water. But these developments had come too late. The Atlantic was held secure by massive Allied forces. The RCN was now able to broaden its activities. 17 corvettes were there for the North Africa invasion. Four tribal-class destroyers helped to clear the way for the invasion of Europe. Two flotillas of Canadian motor torpedo boats fought fiercely in the English Channel. Through the period of intense operations during the invasion, casualties averaged 25%. But the stage was being set for victory. June 6, 1944, D-Day and the invasion of Fortress Europe on a 50-mile span of Normandy beaches. Operation Neptune, the naval side of the operation, was the greatest seaborne assault of all time. The RCN supplied 10,000 men and 104 ships of every classification. Infantry landing, destroyers, frigates, minesweepers, corvettes, landing craft, and a swarm of motor torpedo boats. In poor weather, pounding surf, and heavy fire, over a million Allied forces and millions of tons of material moved victoriously onto the beaches of France. The end of the Battle of the Atlantic was now in sight. Eyes now turned to the Pacific War, where Allied forces were closing in on the collapsing Japanese Empire. The cruiser HMCS Uganda was already fighting with the British Pacific Fleet. But before Canada deployed more ships, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On August 14, 1945, Japan surrendered unconditionally. The Second World War had finally reached its end. During the Second World War, Canada provided over half of all the convoy escorts in the North Atlantic. Without Canada's participation, the Battle of the Atlantic and the movement of strategic materials would have had a far different outcome. By war's end, 24 Canadian warships had gone down and nearly 1,800 had given their lives. The RCN had grown by a factor of 50, with over 100,000 personnel manning over 400 ships, the third largest Allied fleet. Over two-thirds of the ships have been constructed in Canadian yards, as well as over 400 merchant vessels. Canada's Navy had shown the world that they could fight as good as any, and the war had laid a base of experience with which to meet the country's future needs. In 1945, Canadians were tired of war. Most of the 100,000 men and women who had volunteered for service in the RCN just wanted to go home. The economy was buoyant. Social programs like unemployment insurance were in place. University and vocational training was free for veterans. Wages were rising. In these golden years, the Navy was once again out of sight, out of mind. In the three years following the war, Navy budgets were slashed and 350 ships were declared surplus. Most were sold for scrap. Wrens were dismissed as a wartime anomaly. By 1948, there were only 6,800 officers and men in the Navy, manning an active fleet of one carrier, one cruiser, five destroyers, and a frigate. Canada was active in forming the United Nations immediately following the war, with the hope of providing a new means of dealing with international disputes. No longer bound to Britain, Canadians were growing increasingly closer to the United States, their partner in continental defense, a relationship which drew the Royal Canadian Navy increasingly into the orbit of the U.S. Navy. Meanwhile, aggressive post-war behavior by the Soviet Union had sent a chill through Europe. 
few Canadians heeded Churchill's 1946 warning that an iron curtain has descended across the continent. In the U.S., fear of communist subversion bordered on hysteria. And columnist Walter Winchell came up with a new phrase for it, the Cold War. In 1948, the communists took over Czechoslovakia. Weeks later, the Soviets slammed a blockade on Berlin. After the Soviets detonated their own atomic bomb in 1949, Canada, along with 11 other Western powers, signed the North Atlantic Treaty. NATO tied Europe and North America together in mutual defense against the Soviet bloc. As part of the treaty, each member nation had to maintain forces pre-committed to the alliance, regardless of aggressive behavior by the Soviets. Canada's naval contribution was to take the form of anti-submarine forces. The Northwest Atlantic was Canada's established battleground. At sea, a carrier was at the ready, and new ships were on the horizon. In this transitional era, there was a lack of identity and purpose in the Navy, a sense that somehow Canada did not really care. There were those who argued that in an era of nuclear warfare, there was in fact no real role for the Navy. There were also too many relics of the Royal Navy past. Relationships between officers and men geared to the social customs of England and not to those of Canada. As a result, there were a series of incidents, mutinies actually, on a number of Canadian naval vessels in 1949. But no men, in fact, were punished. Rear Admiral E. Rollo Mengi led a commission of inquiry. His report refocused the Navy on core concepts of discipline, service, justice, skill, and education. The Mengi report was instrumental in Canadianizing the Navy and removing the unnecessary social baggage of its British past. In mid-1950, South Korea was suddenly invaded by communist troops from the north, starting the Korean War. The United Nations Security Council endorsed military assistance to South Korea. Three RCN destroyers left Esquimalt on July 5th. In Korea, they operated under the UN flag, along with ships from the US, Britain, Australia, and New Zealand. Over 3,500 Canadian officers and men served in Korean waters. The ships took part in a great variety of tasks, such as shore bombardment and train busting at night, escort duty with aircraft carriers, amphibious assaults, and evacuating wounded. With their good firepower, speed, and versatility, the destroyers fit the bill. The fighting ended in July 1953 but the Canadian force was maintained until the fall of 1955 to help uphold the uneasy peace. The 1950s were a decade of growth and expansion for the RCN. In response to the international situation, the Navy was increased to 20,000 men and women. Commissioned in 1954, HMCS Labrador was the Navy's first and only Arctic patrol ship. Labrador made a series of historic transits from coast to coast, doing groundbreaking survey work and research in the Arctic. Building upon its wartime experience, the RCN made great strides in naval aviation. In the late 40s, the carrier Warrior was exchanged for the Magnificent, and Sea Furies replaced the Sea Fires. In 1950, 75 U.S. Navy Avengers were purchased for anti-submarine warfare. This was part of a continuous move away from the RN routes and towards North American equipment. Then, in 1955, the Banshees arrived. 
These were Canada's first jet fighters equipped with Sidewinder guided missiles. They joined the anti-sub trackers on the angled deck of the HMCS Bonaventure, which took over from the Magnificent in 1957. The most important development of the 1950s was the construction of the Saint Laurent class destroyers. Announced as part of the NATO anti-submarine commitment, the Saint Laurents truly established the identity of the RCN. They were the first new class of ships since the last tribals commissioned in 1948, the most complex ship design and construction ever undertaken in Canada. The first of 18 ships was commissioned in 1955, the last in 1963. These were small ships capable of over 25 knots with substantial range. With heavier armament than frigates, the Saint Laurent's sophisticated action information systems would allow the captain to fight his ship entirely from the operations room rather than the bridge. Thus, the captain could operate in a self-contained citadel within the ship during a nuclear attack. The whaleback design with curved deck edges was intended to discourage ice buildup and facilitate the hosing down by remote control of atomic radiation from the main or weather deck. First class, comfortable ships, they were a justifiable source of pride to everyone in the Navy. They were known as the Cadillacs. The RCN pioneered the use of manned all-weather helicopters from destroyers. During the 60s, the Celerants were extensively rebuilt as destroyer helicopter escorts, emerging with a hangar, a flight deck, and a quick-securing haul-down system, a Canadian-designed mechanism called the Bear Trap. The stern was rebuilt to accommodate variable depth sonar, a Canadian development that overcomes the problem of water layers at varying depths, which confuse fixed sonar systems. The big helicopter small ship marriage was a uniquely Canadian innovation that was further developed in the 60s and 70s in the subsequent Annapolis-class destroyers. By giving small ships the capabilities of variable depth sonar and transportable air power, this trend signaled the long-term demise of the aircraft carrier. By its 50th anniversary in 1960, the RCN had 20,000 people and 62 ships, the largest peacetime fleet in its history. Orders were placed in the United Kingdom for three new Oberon-class submarines, and plans for new general-purpose frigates were underway. In the fall of 1962, the Cold War flared up in Cuba. Soviet nuclear missiles were being deployed in Cuba within range of North America. President Kennedy quarantined Cuba with the U.S. Navy, and Canada's anti-submarine task group took their station in the North Atlantic. Khrushchev backed down, but the Soviets clearly saw the need for a world-class Navy to pursue their aims. In spite of rising international tensions, Lester Pearson's new government froze defense expenditures from 1963 onwards. Several programs were canceled, including the new frigates, and the Navy disposed of older vessels. It was then proposed that the Navy, Army, and Air Force be integrated into one unified entity. A March 1964 white paper on defense predicted that the savings enjoyed from unification would allow 25% of the new budget to be devoted to capital equipment. For a time, all three services were given the same uniform, which was a symbolic and emotional issue in the Navy. More importantly, the Navy lost a proper voice in decision-making at the highest levels. This forced unification provoked a crisis, an admiral's revolt within the Navy, and there were numerous resignations and reassignments. On February 1st, 1968, the titles Royal Canadian Navy, Canadian Army, and Royal Canadian Air Force were abolished. They were replaced by the name Canadian Armed Forces to indicate one unified entity. One green uniform was adopted for the three services, and budget disparities were ironed out. Meanwhile, 
the Cold War was in full swing. In 1968, Soviet tanks rolled into Czechoslovakia to crush the move towards liberalism, the so-called Prague Spring. That same eventful year, NATO established a squadron called the Standing Naval Force Atlantic. Canada's helicopter anti-sub vessels quickly took the spotlight with the best equipment and best trained crews. Stanna Forland demonstrated NATO's solidarity to the world and provided a point of balance to the Soviets' aggressive naval expansion. For the next 20 years, Stana Forland did much to support the profile of Canada's small navy through troubled times. The late 60s were turbulent times, with anti-war demonstrations throughout the United States, Britain and France. During the Quebec crisis of 1970, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act and called in the troops. Internal security became a prime concern. In 1969, Trudeau initiated a major change in defense policy with the protection of national sovereignty as the top priority. Defense of North America was second, then NATO, with peacekeeping at the bottom of the list. Canada's support for NATO was cut by almost half. The Bonaventure, the only remaining aircraft carrier, was retired, putting an end to Canadian naval aviation. As naval resources shrank, Maritime Command's coastal surveillance task grew. In 1970, the traditional three-mile territorial limit was extended to 12 miles. A hundred-mile control zone was established around the Arctic Islands through the Arctic Waters Pollution Act. In 1974, Canada joined an international commission to combat flagrant overfishing extending the zone to 200 miles offshore in 1977. Besides hauling in enormous catches, the huge Eastern Bloc fishing fleets massed submarine movements and gathered intelligence. As usual, Canadian naval resources were stretched thin to deal with the challenge. There were major internal changes in the armed forces in the early 1970s. Budgets were frozen and capital spending slumped. The Canadian Forces headquarters was merged with the Civilian Department of National Defence. While bilingualism made major strides in the armed forces, driven by the Official Languages Act of 1969. In spite of the tight economic restraints, four new Canadian-designed tribal-class destroyers joined the Navy in 1973. The first to be fitted with surface-to-air missiles, these ships ushered in a whole new age of advanced technology. Gas turbines, solid-state electronics, state-of-the-art digital computers. The new ships and systems put new demands on naval training and education. In particular, computer technicians underwent an intense three-year program. In 1976, HMCS Venture, closed since unification, reopened as the Naval Officer Training Center under Maritime Command. All junior naval officers from colleges and universities went through NOTC. Women were now making progress in the forces and in 1979 were at last admitted into the military colleges. In the 80s, operational support ships and non-combatant vessels were open to women. And in 1989, all ships except submarines were opened up to women under Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. By the end of the 70s, the unification of the three forces was unraveling, a development that would see the eventual return of new naval uniforms in 1985, the Navy's 75th anniversary. At this point, the active fleet had stabilized at about 16 destroyers, three submarines, and three support ships, while a few minesweepers and gate vessels were used as training ships. The 75th anniversary also saw the first steel cut for HMCS Halifax, the first of a new class of Canadian patrol frigates. Designed to replace the aging Saint Laurent's, 
They are big ships at 4,750 tons, three times the size of the Second World War frigate. The city-class frigates are primarily anti-submarine vessels with strong self-defense mechanisms and powerful anti-ship capabilities. The ASW system includes one helicopter, the Cantas passive sonar towed array, a hull-mounted attack sonar, and homing torpedoes. Technological advances, many the legacy of the Battle of the Atlantic, have generated a whole new range of capability. Combined with satellite communications, precise navigation systems, and automated information exchange, the officer in tactical command has a tremendous range of control. When the city-class patrol frigate program is complete, there will be 12 ships in total, seven based in Halifax and five in Esquimalt, giving the Navy a balanced and capable fleet. As the Halifax was being built and commissioned, the world changed dramatically. The Soviets pulled out of Afghanistan. In 1989, many Eastern Bloc countries ousted the communist ruling parties and scheduled free elections. The Berlin Wall came down and the Cold War was over. NATO had played an important role in a historic and bloodless victory. Two full generations of Canadian sailors shared in the pride of this achievement. Although the Cold War is over, Canada's Navy continues to play an important role nationally and internationally on the seas of an ever-changing world. Securing Canada's borders against illegal activities, protecting a besieged fishery, contributing to international security, and promoting peace in lands as distant as Haiti, the Persian Gulf, and the Balkans. Through war and peace, the Canadian Navy has played a significant part in the course of history. But the great irony of Canada is that though it has the longest coastline in the world, the vast majority of its people live inland. To most of its citizens, the Canadian Navy is usually out of sight, out of mind. That is, until the next crisis looms on the horizon. It is then that the highly skilled men and women of the Navy rise to proudly meet the challenge before them, selflessly, professionally, and often with great heroism.